You know, I always wondered, I wonder if they could ever do this like thing where they take the Simpsons family and they just do like a Dr. Phil episode with all of them. And he mounted dysfunction with this family. It's like, I don't know about you, like I grew up watching the Simpsons. Uh, I, I remember like half my life, I grew up watching it in secret because my parents were like, don't watch that filth. And, um, and then it just was celebrated in our home. And it's funny how your parents do that, by the way. And uh, just watching it and the amount, I mean, I think people love it because I feel like if we're not that bad, then we must be doing okay. And you watch it and the Simpsons have this way of like seeing all this dysfunction, but they all kind of come together as the Simpsons. There's this weird thing where like you watch them and that's why I love the intro because the intro is like all these different parts of this family and then they come together and they're sitting on the couch together and you can't help but notice that Matt Groening created these very diverse characters, but they're still the Simpsons. They're still family. They're still like kind of home. And it's a pretty interesting picture. And to be honest, and maybe you've never heard this before. Maybe you have. Maybe you've been in a place where you've heard this before, but it's actually a really, really, really great picture of the church. It's true. There is this book that I'm, I'm going to be in tonight. It's, it's actually called Ephesians. And this is a guy named Paul. If you're not familiar with the Bible, this guy named Paul, he wrote a lot of the New Testament. And he writes this letter to this church in this place called Ephesus. It is like literally Asia, at that point, Asia's most famous port. I mean, there's a lot of business was conducted. I, I, to be honest, I think it had a lot of similarities to Edmonton, as they call Edmonton the gateway to the north. A lot of business goes in and out of this place. Ephesus was kind of like that. Ephesus is one of those places where like all these diverse cultures came and a lot of business was done. And so Paul's writing to this kind of brand new church to kind of get to know Jesus. And you've got all this diversity in this church. And he actually, he talks about the church like a family all through his letters. In fact, you know, one place he's like, greet each other with a holy kiss. Some of you are like, all right, all right, all right. You know, like, I've been spying a few people. I don't mind doing that with. And um, the other place where he says, you know, to greet each other like brothers and sisters. And sometimes if you're not familiar with church and you walk in and like someone's like, hey, brother, hey, sister. And you're like, this is like the most high class inbreeding cult I've ever been to. Uh, or I'm misunderstanding the terminology here. There's all this diversity. In fact, within this church in Ephesus, there was like people were going to church and Paul's calling them family. They're going to church literally with enemies. They were economic enemies. They were religious enemies. They were cultural enemies. They were race enemies. And so there was all this diversity within this family. And I think you get it. I mean, if you were to look around here, maybe some of you, you look around this room and you say, there probably are maybe some people who've hurt you. There's maybe some people in this church in this place who maybe never called you back when you, after your first date, and now you sit on total opposite sides. There are people maybe here that you think you look at them, you're like me and you would never get along. Maybe it's by the way they look, maybe it's by the way they smell, maybe it's by the friends they hang out with, but you're like, there's just, you get this, you get this. This is what this church was kind of like. There was so much diversity, but yeah, it's so interesting. Because he says, like, he starts the first half of the book basically talking about, listen, at one point, we were all foreigners to Jesus. We were all enemies of Jesus. We were all people who didn't, we had no unity with Jesus. There's no peace, but he's like, Christ came and he made peace. All of you, all of you are foreigners. Now you're all family. You're all children of God. You're all in here. Now there's peace. And then the latter half of his book all talks about that peace should translate into peace between you. All this diversity within your family. And it, what's funny, this whole letter is based in that. Because he's one thing I think we all understood. And, and, and he did it because it's like, one, if Jesus, if we were foreigners and he made us family, then this is how you should react and act with each other. Because he says this, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. I mean, if he's made a difference and live people like light. Why? Because for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. So unity is good, it's right, and it's true. And these are all things I think we love. We want a life that is good, that is right, that is true. We want all those things. So Paul's like, listen, live in unity because it's good, it's right, and it's true. But Paul understands, like you and I do, that often what is good, what is right, what is true really depends on the kind of relationships we have with each other. You can be good, right, and true if you were by yourself. Because, well, there's no one else to compare it to. But the minute you add someone into your life, the minute something happens to someone you love, the minute something happens to you from someone who maybe you hated or loved you at, at some point, or you loved at some point, the minute it happens, what is good, what is right, and what is true 
tends to feel like it's crumbling, the way that we feel, the joy that we feel, the fulfillment in life, unfortunately is really tied into the kind of relationships we have. And, and Paul knows this and we know it. But he says, unity is the mark of a true Christian. He says, imitate God therefore in everything you do because you are his kids. Listen, if you are his kids, then unity has to bind you together. And here's the thing, he goes so far as to saying, it's not actually expected of people who don't know Jesus. It shouldn't be. He says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as Gentiles do. Gentiles, if you don't understand, basically means people who are kind of don't know Jesus. These are, again, at this point, it's not like these were all Jewish people. There was, I mean, a, a cacophony of, of cultures and races and things like that and beliefs. So don't live like them for they're hopelessly confused. Now that sounds super like, excuse me, I'm not hopelessly confused, right? I may not follow Jesus, but I'm not hopeless and I'm not confused. This is not a general term for people who don't walk into Jesus' way. This is a contextual thing he's saying at this point. He's like, these people revel in their disunity. So this shouldn't be you. The expectation is that Christian love and unity should be different in our life. If we claim to follow Jesus, there should be a difference. And everyone else around you should notice that there's a difference, that even in the midst of that diversity, that there could be peace, that there could be unity. This whole series is wrapped around this idea that there are these awkward relationships in our life. That you come to them and, and you remember those moments where you're like sitting across from someone and you're like, this is awkward. I remember this one time I was at a Starbucks meeting with someone. This was years ago before I was here. So don't try to think, was that with me? I, and um, I was talking to this person about another person. And I had my spiritual reasons to do it. And I didn't realize that the person's aunt was listening to the conversation I didn't realize until my boss called me into his office a week later and realized this is awkward. Uh, those moments, those relationships. Last week we talked about that relationship with yourself, how oftentimes I think we're losing you. And how do we capture that? How do we create safe boundaries? And if you didn't hear it, you know, go on our YouTube or podcast, find it. And we have these relationships that are awkward, relationships with people who I think once maybe we liked, but now we don't like, or they stabbed you in the back. How do you deal with that? Or those people you disagree with intensely. Or tonight, those people who raised you. Because he actually specifically addresses that relationship. It says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. Why? Because you're God's kids for this is the right thing to do. And here's the thing, he kind of starts this whole section with this. He says, so be careful how you live. Sounds like good advice. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. It's practical, it's, it's super practical. I mean, Paul goes right into it. It's about living well. It's about the good life, the right life, the true life. And here's the thing though, he says, there's no way out of it. There's no way out of doing this because this is the way that you're supposed to live if you follow Jesus. There should be unity. And then he says, including the complicated relationship you have with your parents. He addresses it. Do you know one of the interesting things that we get at the project when we ask people what you want us to talk about, surveys that we do, one of the top five issues that young adults tell us is that they don't know how to relate to their parents anymore how to deal with those dysfunctions, how to deal with the baggage. And the key theme tonight is this. You and I are responsible for how we relate to our parents. Not only do I think it's because it's the Lord's will for your life, but I think even if you don't follow Jesus, because it's good for you. And it's weird because for so long, our parents were the responsible ones or semi-responsible, depends. Maybe some of you didn't grow up with your parents. Maybe you didn't have any parents who were able to be responsible or irresponsible. Maybe just the guardians, maybe it was your grandparents, whoever was raised you. But when we become adults, there's this weird thing that happens where we actually have to pick up the responsibility of figuring out how we relate to them. For at once, it was all about what they did for us, how they related to us, their responsibility to care for us. But now we need to be thinking, what does it look like for us to take responsibility in our relationship with our parents? In fact, many Jewish 
teachers, a lot of Jewish wisdom said that this is actually the greatest commandment ever given was to obey our parents. But here's the thing, it also had a promise attached. He says this, hey, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord for this is the right thing to do. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you because they won't kill you. And you will have a long life on earth again because they won't kill you. There are promises attached to this. In fact, if you read to like the 10 commandments in the Old Testament, this is the first one that says there is a promise attached to it, that you'll live a long life. This is good for you. But what does it look like? What does it look like maybe if you had good parents, but now the relationship is shifting and changing? What happens if maybe you didn't have great parents and you didn't really have a relationship? What do you do? What happens if you learned really bad behaviors and patterns? What happened if they hurt you? What happened if they broke you? How do you relate to them? What does that look like? And that's really where I want to go tonight. And there's three things that we need to know. It's because in church, I find like it's always three things. I don't know why, but it's always three things. And I came up with three things. Three things we need to know about our parents, about ourselves, that is going to help us relate really well. Because I think we read this passage, like children obey your parents, like, oh, that's for someone who's like under 16. I'm no child, I'm my own man, right? Like, ain't no one tell me what I'm doing. But the idea, it's for us. You didn't be like, hey, children under 18, obey your parents. You didn't say that. There's responsibility, but it, there's a bit of a, a way of understanding this that maybe if you're over 18 would be different from maybe a 12-year-old. Although some of you act like you're 12. But anyways, beyond the point. I want to know so that when Paul is talking about these relationships, he actually does include the parents. He, because the first thing we need to understand about our parents is this, that they're actually human. Weird, right? They're humans. They are human beings. At one point, they were you. And maybe that hasn't hit you home yet with you yet. But if that's you, I need to let you know that they were once you. They were once you somewhere between 18 and 30, a whole life ahead of them. They probably wanted to make something of themselves. And what I love about this is Paul humanizes them. He addresses them. Why? Because they are humans. They are part of the the, the disunity in the church, that there is a relationship that is broken that shouldn't be broken. Why? Because they are also children of God, as you are a child of God. And I'll get this. Paul does immediately address the parents and their responsibility, but they're kind of off the hook tonight. I want to really talk about what Paul says to you because your parents aren't here. Unless you brought your parent, I'm sorry. (laughs) If you're a parent here, you're welcome because this is the only message you'd be like, are you hearing them? Hmm? Are you hearing them, right? When you're a kid, I think parents typically would look at a hero. As a teen, they were idiots. As a young, young adult, they had money and you didn't. As you grow up as a young adult, and they had groceries too, which is amazing. Uh, As you grow older, as an older YA, I think you quickly notice that your parents have holes in their lives, that they are not perfect, they don't have it all together, that they made mistakes, that they made mistakes with you, that you're not the mistake, but they made mistakes with you. Now, some of you come to grips with that very early on in your childhood. I know many of your stories are like, no, I knew my parents were screwed up when I was young because of what they did to me. As a general rule, statistics show, just generalizing here, so I'm being honest, I'm generalizing this. It's typically around 22 to 28, you begin realizing that your parents make mistakes. And for some people, it's pretty hard to deal with that. But here's the thing, you'll see them as human when you get married. When you especially start having kids, or if you decide to have kids, some of you won't, that's fine. Anytime there's someone else that you got to care for, maybe it's a roommate that doesn't pay rent. Maybe it's just a relationship that's hard to take care of. You'll just realize going, I wish someone just understood is hard. Your parents at some point had to take on the pressure of being, of raising this child. I remember the first time my, my first child was handed to me. I was like, so how many of you nurses are coming home with us? Because I don't want to go home alone. Like, I'm going to kill this child. I always feel like, how are you as a parent? I'm like, well... He survived till 10 so far, so I think I'm doing okay. You know, like, there is a point where your parents were you, and then a child was handed to them, and they're like, ooh, right? Yeah, like the epic music kind of showed up, and <laughs> how do I handle this? Silence a good option, by the way. And um, <laughs> they're humans, they're imperfect, they set 
patterns, unfortunately, that became your norm. And at some point in your life, you realized those are bad patterns. At some point in your life, for a lot of your life, it was just patterns that you just knew that was your normal until you met other human beings and you're like, whoa, that's not normal. Like one, you know, for me, it wasn't even that difficult, but my parents, for example, never talked about money and they never talked about emotions. And so I literally am a vault of emotions. I don't know how to share them. Catherine's like, how are you doing? I'm like, and she's just learned my noises, you know, and I had to learn about money the hard way. They never talked about that stuff. And, but for some of you, they're really unhealthy patterns. And, and part of recognizing that they're human is that they set these patterns in your life. Whether good or bad, whether you were raised by chimpanzees or a human, you've got baggage. You've got issues. And so there's a couple options. Option A is this. You just live out from the pain or the problem. That you say, because of this, then I am this. Because of this, I am that. Because of this, I will do this. Because of that, I will not do that. That's option A. Option B is this. I will totally ignore it because there's nothing wrong with me. Like nothing, right? There's just nothing. And you just choose to ignore it. If you don't know this, both of these ways are not the right way to respond, okay? Especially if you're twitching. When we do this, we actually give the dysfunction power in our lives rather than responding appropriately and decisively for freedom. When we ignore it or when we just live out from it, like a lot of people are like, they get married because their parents don't like it. I'm like, that's a dumb reason to get married. Because the only people that are going to live with your consequences are you. And that's the weird thing about this. Option C is this. Maybe you need to do the work of recognizing where those dysfunctional patterns are. Whether they're small or they're big. Ask yourself, what patterns are there? What maybe is something my parents taught me without knowing they did or knowingly did that are wrong, that I'm not okay with, that have really kind of messed me up a little bit, that are affecting how I relate to myself, to other people? And ask yourself, what does the process of forgiveness look like? This, this is hard. Because there is an idea that your parents shouldn't have done that. They should have done this. It was their responsibility. They were the adults. Why did they? And I get that. But if we don't deal with handing over that unforgiveness, then we let that dysfunction rule our life instead of turning it into something that can make our life in a positive direction. To actually relate to our parents properly. If you want to have some sort of or semblance of relationship with your parents, many of us will have to find a way to forgive our parents what they've done or didn't do. It's not just glossing over it. To forgive our parents' brokenness and realize that they were broken, that they were dysfunctional, as we would want to be forgiven. How would we want to be forgiven? Would we want someone to base their whole life on what dysfunctional patterns we set for them? Or do we want forgiveness? Paul, he says this, listen, in Ephesians 4, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Listen, these are people that aren't just like, oh yeah, this person like, they gave me a Coke instead of a Pepsi. Now these are people who literally were slave masters. These were people with deep dysfunctions and hurt, bigotry and racism. And he's saying, find a way to get rid of all bitterness and anger and instead replace with forgiveness. Why? Because you need to trade the pain and bitterness and dysfunction for freedom from being defined by it. And until you find a way to let go of it, your life will always be defined by what they did to you. It's to swallow the injustice and it's so unfair to swallow the injustice in order to stop it. But I want you to hear me out. And I don't want to expand on this too much because I know we're going into this next week a little bit more. 
Some of you are asking, do, do I just like forgive and forget then? No, that's not what I'm telling you. There's forgiveness and then there's what's called reconciliation. Paul says this in this book called Romans. He says, if, it's poss- if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. What is he saying there? Forgiveness takes one person in a relationship. Reconciliation always takes two. Paul is saying as much as you can, You can forgive someone, but it doesn't mean that you can be trampled upon them again. It doesn't mean that you should open up your life to them again. It doesn't mean that you should allow dysfunction in. And I'll get to this in a little bit, but forgiveness is the ability to say, I know you did something wrong. It's not right, but I'm beginning the process of letting it go, however long it takes me and whatever helps I need to do that. But if on the other side, there's no sense of recognizing that they've done wrong, or there's no semblance of wanting to actually reconcile the relationship. Your job is only to forgive. If reconciliation can't happen, it can't happen. It takes two people to make that happen. But here's what I wanna get across. You cannot outrun dysfunction. You can't outrun patterns that have been set in your life for a couple decades. It needs to be dealt with. And so some of you need to deal with it by seeking out help. Maybe you don't have these huge dysfunctions to forgive your parents for. Maybe it's just small things, but some of you need to seek some outside help. You need to figure out who do I need to talk to? How can I get help working through these things? It's gonna be hard and it's gonna suck. But that's how new life is resurrected is when you come to grips with what's died inside of you and you begin to see maybe where God could be producing new life in that area. Some of you, though, have never thanked your parents for good patterns. Some of you need to go home and thank your parents for the good things that they did for you. Some of you need to go home and thank your parents that they tried as best as they possibly could to provide whatever they could for you. When was the last time you went home and you're like, you know what, mom, thanks for not throwing me out on the street. Like I remember myself as a kid, I was never allowed in churches. I always got kicked out of youth group. I always got kicked out of those things because I was a terrible child. I almost lit a church field on fire twice. I, thank you mom and dad for not putting a pillow over my head when I was asleep. You know, like, I always remember my dad coming home and when he got home right from work, he'd always, the first thing he'd do, go and give my mom a kiss. It was a little gross. But now it's just like, when was the last time you thanked your mom or dad or your guardian or whoever cared for you for their good patterns? The people who maybe cared deeply for you through the dysfunction. Maybe you didn't have a real mom or dad, but you had people who were kind of beside you through it all. And who have you thanked? First thing is understand they're human. Second thing is this, that what Paul's saying is honoring you or honoring your parents actually ironically means honoring yourself. Things will go well for you. You will have a long life on the earth. There is a bit of a selfish motivation here. What he's saying here is there's nothing that will honor your parents more, I think, than living the right kind of life. It pleases God when you find good pleasure, when you live wisely. That's why Paul says, live wisely. Don't act thoughtlessly, know what you're doing. Why? Because it's good for you. And God wants you to have a good life. God wants you to enjoy life. God wants you to see uh, in the midst of everything you'll be walking through that you are good, that you are loved. And I don't think there's anything that can honor a parent more than actually living well. But some of you live in a way where all you do is give your parents grief. Some of you just live in a way that you just hope your parents are gonna bail you out all the time. Some of you live in a way that you keep your parents up at night wondering if you're gonna end up somewhere where you shouldn't end up. Some of you have not called your parents because you have so much anger in your heart. There's just no room for anything. And Paul's saying, listen, maybe it's time for you to think about what it can mean for you to just switch your life a little bit. To not act thoughtlessly. In fact, when Paul talks about being wise, he's meaning someone who sees every decision they make is interconnected with the people around them and the rest of their lives. That you don't just make a decision today that has no impact or bearing on the future or anyone else, but knowing wise, knowing that every decision you make 
actually impacts the lives around you and it impacts your future. So the question is, what kind of future do you want to have? What kind of relationship would you like to have with your parents? Well, that ownership is a bit on you. And part of it too is what kind of life do you want to have? Do you live your life in a way that if you set the continual pattern that you're living right now, that you're going to end up 10 years down the road where you want to be? Some of you have to think about that. See, most parents from conception ugh, have felt the desire to ensure you have more freedom, more life, opportunity, love, and et cetera than they ever had. Most parents do. And at this point of life, you should be making adult decisions. You should be. You should be beginning the process of adulting. Honoring them has nothing to do with obeying them blindly. That's not what Paul's saying here. It's about living a life that produces something good. That's just what it means. Honoring them means to produce something that would be a blessing to them. This is how they'll see that you've done well. And that if they are on your side, it's quite a way to be honored by your kids. But if they're not on your side, it's quite a way to show them how different life could be. A lesson. Maybe a reason for them to think, maybe we don't have it all right. There's just no giving around it, whether you have a good relationship with them or not. Because the irony is this, is that at the end, it actually honors you too. Because you become wise. When you watch your life, you become wise. Because when you're wise, you pass on your life onto whoever's connected to your life. Especially when we have children, if you have them, or the friends, the significant other relationships you have. When you are wise, it not only affects your life, but it affects other people's lives around you in a positive way. When you honor and think that way, it actually honors yourself too. That's the promise. But you're thinking, what if my parents weren't that? The lowest rung on the ladder of this verse means to respect them as human beings. And maybe that's all you can get to. Maybe that's the only rung on the ladder you can get up to is going, yes, they are in fact humanoids. And maybe that's where you just need to leave them is just with God going, God, I know somehow you love them. I just don't. I'm not there. but you need to respect the fact that they were made in the image of God, whether or not they are a very muddy version of God. It's a sense where you got to trust that God loves them and sees the pain and hurt more than you ever could. That he sees the whole of their life. And you only have a very limited perspective. And what this means is just to respect them as someone who are made in the image of God. And maybe if you're someone who doesn't subscribe to Christ or the Jesus-based life or this teaching, maybe for you it's just you need to respect them that they are human beings. And it may be hard to think that way, but that's the challenge. It also means, I love this, in the book of James, James is the um, half-brother of Jesus, he writes a book in the Bible called James. He has a lack of creativity, but he, he says this about the way we speak. But a tiny spark can set a great force on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. Where do you start? Be careful what you say. Be careful who you say it to, when you say it, and why you're saying it. Here's the thing about her mouth. You may be totally justified in how you feel about your parents. They may be the worst. But you and I have to be careful how we speak about it. But here's what words do. They affect your thinking patterns. That if you constantly say the same thing about someone, it's funny how you can just keep believing that same thing over and over again. You concrete it. It attracts the same kind of people. So you begin realizing, hey, everyone I hang out with hates their parents. That is not awesome, by the way. Because you're insulating the same language, the same feeling, and it reveals what's actually going on inside, but actually never heals what's going on inside. That is how your tongue can set your whole life on fire. So maybe what you need to do is be careful what you say. 
at who you say it to and ask yourself, why am I saying it? Third thing and last thing is this. You can no longer be a taker in your relationship with your parents. This is gonna hurt by the way. Of the 4.3 million young adults aged 20 to 29 in 2011, 42% or 1.8 million lived with their parents. This compared with 27% in 1981. That number is going up by the way. Among young adults aged 20 to 24, 59.3 lived in their parental home, higher than the 41.5% who did so in 1981. For 25 to 29 year olds, one quarter lived with their parents in 2011, more than double the 11.3 share in 1981. This is interesting. Young men are more likely to live at home than young women. In 2011, some of you girls are like, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> In 2011, 46.7% of men in their 20s lived in their parental home compared to 37.9% of women in this age group. And here's the thing, this is, not, this is not a hard thing. There's a lot of reasons for it. And there's a lot of good reasons for this. A lot of you are in school, your debts are higher. It's hard to find a really good job. And I actually think in many situations, it's actually better to live at your parents' home. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying this is the part that I'm saying is gonna suck or gonna hurt. No, this is just a reality. A lot of you live at home, but whether you're living at home or not, you are required to take the responsibility of being responsible for yourself. For your own lives, your own decisions. This means taking responsibility for your past. Where did I go wrong? What do I need to ask for forgiveness? Where did I really push the pattern? It's taking responsibility for your present to not just sit around and waiting for life to happen. It's this is the time in life where you can figure out who you are, who you want to be to experience, to try things, to learn about money, to do what you can to adult. It's to invite them in the process. If you're in that relationship with your parents, invite them into it. This is where you start the detachment process. Maybe it's starting to buy your own groceries. Maybe it's just once every three months. You know, it's just like, but that is going to be four times more a year than I ever did, right? Like you start there. Maybe it's paying a little bit of rent. Maybe it's respecting the rules of the home. Here's the thing, it's like, don't tell me when to come home. Well, if you're living in their house, you obey their rules. That's taking responsibility because if you were in someone else's home, you'd respect it. It's just reality. There is a sense that they're telling you, hey, I want you home at like before two. And you're like, well, five sounds pretty good. You know, like, you have, if you're living in their home, that's it. But sometimes it's actually realizing that maybe living at home isn't the best way for this relationship to progress. Some of you, sometimes a better idea is actually not to live at home. It's to find someplace else. Maybe some of your relationships will only be healed through some distance. And also means taking responsibility for your future. It's finding a way to become independent. Knowing how to set up healthy boundaries with your parents. And this is super important. Like I said, Loving your parents doesn't equate to obeying everything they say. You move from a role of dependency to mutuality. It's adult to adult. But if you're living at home and doing nothing with your life, expecting to be treated like an adult, that's your problem, not theirs. If you wanna have an adult to adult relationship, it means trying to become an adult to make those decisions, to make wise decisions. And I think most of you are there, but you can't expect something that you have not, I'd say inspect. So if there's, if there's healthy patterns in your parents' lives that are affecting you, it means being okay with setting up boundaries and going, I will engage you when you're functional, but not when you're dysfunctional. That's done with grace. It's done with a lot of prayer, with a lot of wisdom and some advice. But some of you need to set up boundaries with your parents because it's just on the other path and pattern. Sometimes they get way too involved. Sometimes you can't find that, that distance. This is part of it, is setting up those boundaries. You may have to disagree with your parents. You may have to, in fact, disobey them. Even if sometimes it's not the best thing for you, part of adulting is trying things out and trying to make those decisions and owning up to mistakes you've made. And sometimes it's them owning mistakes that they've made. There's a part of this adulting which requires you to sometimes not do what they want you to do because you feel like, honestly, that's the best thing for you to do. You need to hear their advice, but it doesn't mean you need to follow it. You have to own your decisions. You may have to set up boundaries on what they control, on what they say and how they say it. Tell them that you are making decisions as an adult. 
That's part of it. And sometimes it won't be understanding there. But I always say this, oftentimes the fruit of our lives only come out over a period of time. And sometimes it's even hard for our parents to know that and think that. Sometimes it's hard for them to think with what they were like at 20. And sometimes you just gotta make those decisions, set up those boundaries. I know that's there. That takes some work. That takes some time. And you're probably gonna screw up a few times. But you gotta do that. Can I encourage you? Sometimes the first step is actually, to change is actually giving something. Maybe it's praying for your parents. Maybe it's giving a bit of understanding. Maybe it's giving a bit of support. And sometimes it's actually giving advice. Sometimes it means those things. That's, sometimes that's what mutuality means. And I think that's actually, you can do that in a very honoring way. Mom and dad, I care about you. I've noticed this. You're not giving me enough money every month. You know, like, uh, that was a joke, by the way. Um, <laughs> but I want to end giving you a few ideas, a few questions I wanna encourage you, if you have enough of a relationship with your parents or whoever raised you or attempted to, the few questions I'm gonna leave you with, and I'm gonna put these questions up on our Instagram, but there's a couple of good ones. I want you to ask yourself this. Who's had the greatest impact on your life? Then I want you to ask your parents. As a kid, what did you wanna be when you grew up? What did you still dream of, what do you still dream of doing? Ask yourself, to what degree am I responsible for the course of my life has taken? And ask your parents, what is something when looking back on your life you regret? Why? Ask yourself, looking back, is there anything you need to ask forgiveness for from your parents? Ask your parents, what is something you wish I did more of? Is there something you wish I did less of? That'll be tough. But hear them out. Ask yourself, what has been life-giving? What has been life-draining? Ask your parents, how would your parents have described you? In all of this, it's about finding a way of seeing your, pers- your parents' personhood. Part of this is honoring them so that you know that in the end, you're honoring yourself. You can no longer retake her, but more than anything, because what Paul says, this is good for you. This is what it means to try to find, even among diversity, some peace and some unity. What are the greatest lessons you've learned in life to date? Ask yourself and ask your parents, what are the greatest lessons you've learned in life to date? Again, I'll put these all up on Instagram. Maybe you're here tonight and you've got questions about this whole Jesus-based life. I always tell people the best place to start is by texting that number and texting next. Send you a little booklet. There's no commitment to it. It's just like finding out what this Jesus-based life looks like. And I love Jesus says, come follow me. He doesn't say, come believe me right now. He says, come follow me, come watch me, come listen to my life, my words. That's what this means. And if that's you, I'm gonna encourage you to do that. No one's gonna get a hold of you unless you want someone to. It's literally just a free resource for you just to look at what does it mean to follow Jesus. But all this, do you mind if I pray with you tonight? I'll let you go. Jesus, I thank you that um, you want us to have a good, true, right life. That's sometimes super hard. I think that's why you said to us, loving you includes loving our enemies. And it's weird when our own enemies, we lived in their home. That can be a tough thing. That can be a very hard thing. And I think apart from your spirit and apart from your help, it's almost impossible. I don't know every situation in this room, but Jesus, I'm thankful that you do. And I'm thankful that wherever we're at, God, you can meet us in that place. God, help us to do what Paul asks us to do. Because of the unity we have with you and the peace that you've made with us, Jesus, help us to live in peace with other people, including our parents or those people who raised us, whether it was good or bad. God, help us be the kind of people that live differently as an expression of how no matter who we are and where we come from, Jesus, you see us, you know us, you love us. Amen. Guys, thanks for hanging out tonight. Thanks for being here at the project. Come back next week as we continue our series. Awesome. Enjoy some iced coffee on us. Go out, enjoy, stick around, hang out.